What's up, everybody? We're back here with another edition of Dapper Conversations. This time we in the beautiful Pacific Northwest, the Emerald City, Seattle. They don't call it the rain city. The only rain we producing is the drip. You see us out here looking fresh and fly. Uh, my name is Evan Marshall, uh, VP of Partnerships. I'm filling in for our normal host, Neandre Boussard, this weekend. we got some wonderful guests with us here. First to my left, we got the Prada Tacoma, Seattle Seahawks legend, entrepreneur, philanthropist, Marcus Trufant. We got my guy, DeAndre Campbell, athlete, entrepreneur, trainer, does it for the kids. And my ace at the end down there, Rashad Little, style influencer, expert, and the best follow on TikTok. We got another guy here, you might say that, but nah, Rashad's the best follow on TikTok. What's up, fellas? How y'all doing? Doing well, bro. Doing, doing well. Doing good, well. man. Good. Appreciate y'all for joining us. So how we like to start this off is, I'm going to start with you, Marcus, right? Tell me about where you from, what you do out here, but also... City of Seattle, what makes Seattle unique? But then also, how did you find out about black men's wear? Well, yes, born and raised in Washington, born and raised in Tacoma, like you said. Uh, it did everything here, man. I played college ball here, played professional ball here. My family, my friends, everybody is here. So I'm uh, Washington through and through. Um, I don't, I, I travel, but I don't go far. I like to do everything local. Um, of course, I have a nonprofit, True Pond Family Foundation, giving back to the kids, giving back to the city. Man, is what I do. So um, doing everything here has been great. Transition from uh, sports, I've been working in real estate via um, self-storage. And um, yeah, just doing it like that, man. I'm a uh, soccer dad. I'm a cheer dad. I do my thing. I got five kids, a wife and five kids, of course. I got to okay. shout out the wife. So uh, yeah, man, it's been great. And just continuing the brand, trying to move forward, man, and do good for my kids, do good for the community, and just continue to give back. Oh, yo, man, five kids? You got five kids, five. <laughs> it's heavy, it's heavy. It's goals right there. Yeah, yeah. Goals. And how did you hear about black men's wear originally? How I heard about black men's wear was um, through the social media, right? Oh. I didn't know much about you guys. Um, as I've been doing research and as I've been looking at more and kind of checking out you guys' page and stuff, you guys do a lot of great stuff. Of course, talking to you today, I'm learning a lot. And um, I know that you guys like to get fresh, so I was uh, <laughs> very excited to see that I like to dress so it was good, man. But um, just hearing about all the great stuff, and um, now you guys got a new fan. So hey, appreciate you rocking us. How about DeAndre? How about yourself? Yeah, man. So originally, I'm from Oakland, California. Uh, I came out here on a football scholarship to play at the University of Washington, um, where I play receiver. Um, and then while I was here, man, Seattle just became a second home. Um, you know, I built. I, I literally tell people this all the time, man. I left Oakland. As an 18-year-old boy, man, and when I when I got done, at, at, you know, when I got done playing at UW and I went to the 49ers undrafted, I left Seattle a man, you know what I'm saying? So for me, Seattle became a second home. Um, and how I found out about black menswear was just because I just, I saw the flash mobs. And like Marcus, like, like Marcus, like myself, man, I love to dress up. So if I got a reason to dress up, I'm looking for it. And, you know, I like guys that wear unique combinations that don't just, you know, go with the generic, you know, suit that you see here and right. there but you know i saw all the different styles all the different creativity and fashion and stuff like that and just brothers coming together and so i was just like okay i like what they doing and i saw the flash mobs and then as soon as they said you come to seattle i was like yes <laughs> i'm there so yeah man I'm, I'm glad to be here appreciate you appreciate it rashad you actually been to a couple of them haven't you yeah um i went to the atlanta one which was crazy um that really opened my eyes to the you know to the whole thing y'all been doing um, I knew about black men's wear beforehand, but um, I had no idea that like the, the flash mobs was as big as it is and it attracts so many people like it does. It's, it's a real thing. But um, yeah, came to Seattle. I've been here for, well, just left here, but I was here for three years. Um, military brought me here. My family's military. And um, yeah, while I was here, I started to miss the little brand, what I do now. And um, man, the one thing about this city is it's just so, you hear about the Seattle freeze, but everyone's here is just so accepting and inviting. You know, people here from all walks of life, you got your corporate people, you got your entrepreneur people, social media people, and people just let you do your thing, you know, and they're, they're very supportive here. I got a ton of support along my journey. Um, I'm in LA now, but um, Seattle to me is, as you said, like a second home, it really is. Great. And one of the topics we want to touch on here is like debunking stereotypes and the overcoming obstacles. But one of the really big things there is like you think about the Pacific Northwest, you like to say there's not a lot of us out here. Mm -hmm. Right. But all three of you said, OK, you being from here, both of you gentlemen said, OK, you, you came here, became a second home for you. So talk with you, Rashad, coming out here, being the military, brat, like how did how did Seattle embrace you? What was it unique about it in terms of debunking that stereotype in terms of us being here as a people and as a culture? You know, without social media, I would not have 
met a ton of black people like I have here and, and met a lot of friends. Um, honestly, I did it through hashtags, through obviously putting myself out there and um, just going on uh, Eventbrite, looking at just different events going on. And it's, it's, it's a lot of us here. But um, the city embraced me where it's not really a fashionable city. I don't think anyone would say that. However, I think that's why I stood out so much. One, being black, but two, being fashionable. Um, I think I really opened people people's eyes to like just, yo, that's, that's, that's clean too, that look is clean too. I know we do the boots and the jackets and the Carhartt, um, but you know, rocking blazers or rocking turtlenecks or just my way of how I come to the game. Um, I think I brought something fresh here and I, I, people just really accepted it. Oh, yeah. dope. And you know, DeAndre, yourself, obviously, you from Oakland, right? So yeah. Oakland, when you think of like <laughs> one of the black cities in America, Oakland is one of those. So like, yeah. well, how was your transition, especially coming here to play ball and going to college student as well? It's like 18, 19 year old. That's really some of the formative years that you have. Yeah, man. No, it was, uh, it was, uh, I mean, the, the best way I could describe it was a reality check. Like, you know, growing up in Oakland, you know, it's predominantly black community. Uh, then coming to Seattle and then I go to, I get on campus in UW and there's this spot on campus called Red Square and it's like thousands of people literally are in Red Square and I remember walking in when school started and literally I didn't see a whole lot of black people so I'm mm -hmm. like okay well is this what the world is like because this is not, this is not Oakland, I know this is not Oakland um, but one thing that I found was that um, amongst all you know the diversity there were black people and one thing that I realized for me is it's less about the number and more about the quality of relationships with people. And so um, I built a lot of great relationships with a lot of great people here um, and, you know, grew relationships organically um, and it was embraced by the community in Seattle. So um, and the black community in Seattle. So um, that's why I said, man, for me, it was just like, OK, I wasn't coming out here with the you know best understanding of familiarity. But, you know, over time and meeting new people, like you said, like you just you just get used to it and it, it gets comfortable. Okay, super. Yeah. And how about yourself? You got a different point of view because you were born and raised here, so. Right, yeah, um, I do got a different point of view, but I guess my point of view, because I didn't grow up in, you know, Oakland and this was home and this is what I was used to. So there, um, being from Tacoma and then being able to move up to Seattle, back in the day, there was this little thing, okay, we're from Tacoma, then you grew up in Seattle. Tacoma's always been looked at as kind of like the little brother <laughs> to Seattle, right? But there is black folks here. Sometimes you got to look for them and you got to right. search for them, but different events and different things bring out the black people. And when we come together, it's really powerful because it's not a lot of us out here and you don't see us, um, you know, just all the time in these certain places like that on a just being on campus and stuff right. like that it's hard to find you know should i guess you're talking about outside of the athletes and yeah, stuff yeah, like that yeah, it's yeah, hard yeah, to yeah, find yeah. a bunch of black people on campus it was the same at washington state too yeah. probably even worse because there's no city out there right <laughs> right, right right but right. um just but you got to find your core group of people um and that's what i found out here i mean i got my core group of friends i got my core group and you kind of try to bring people into that and you're looking for those like-minded people that want to do the same thing that they got the same views as you got and they want to grow that and they want to expand that and find those same type of people and do good in the community and reach out to the youth and do all that kind of stuff so that's kind of the energy that I give off and then you kind of get that back and you know what I'm saying so no and that's honestly it's funny that you say that in terms of giving that energy off and trying to cultivate that community that's one of the things that we really take pride in with black menswear and a lot of times with the flash mob you see a lot of people say oh it's just a photo shoot but when you actually come and actually experience it you realize and feel not just realize you feel how much more than it is than that because one of the things I like to say you've got a hundred brothers black men to kind of come in together even if it's just like the energy, the smiling, the camaraderie, the connectivity that you have, I can just make a hundred black men smile for an hour with everything we got to do with it in our life. That's enough for me, right? Yeah, yeah, we do more than that. We give back, we have mentorship programs and things of that nature, but even just making people smile for an hour, for an hour is enough in itself. So I like the fact that you say that. So I guess to that point, even with your transitioning with uh, with everything you do in the entrepreneurial spirit, you mentioned earlier you're in real estate, but you're doing it from the storage aspect. I can imagine there's probably not a lot of within that space as well. How do you make yourself visible mm -hmm. in that space to kind of help stand out and kind of help build your business as well? Well, um, for me, it comes down to being somebody that others can look at, right? It kind of being the one that's stepping out first and being this example, right? That, okay, you, um, 
played sports, you did this, and you're not the stereotypical athlete. That you don't go out and you don't spend all your money, that you didn't go broke, that you don't got a bunch of outside kids. Of course, that's no disrespect to people that right. are going through those things, but that's how they look at us as athletes. And then when you come out and you want to transition, it's hard to trust, right? But you come into this space and you'd be like, okay, um, that I want to be able to give back. I want others to come out. I want others to do well. Because if you look at the stats, I think it's like 70-something percent of guys go broke yeah. after they're done playing. So to be that and to show people that it can be done and I can do it the right way. Of course, I got a wife. I got my kids like I talked about. And I'm not out here trying to shine and do it like that. But I just want to be that example and um, to just be able to show people it can be done. No, and I think keyword that said out there was trust. Mm -hmm. Like that's how you create visibility within yourself is developing that trust. So I want to kind of pivot so down to you to Rashad for you with obviously the followers that you have. A lot of guys come to you because you provide them tips, techniques in terms of helping them um, identify who they are, whether it's style, whether it's grooming and things of that nature. And things of that nature. How have you been able to develop that trust digitally with some of these guys you might not even be able to meet? Consistency. I would definitely say consistency. I mean, I've been in this space for three years and really haven't taken any time off, you know. Um, and and uh, I, believe I, I, be, I believe I dress pretty well, too. So I think guys can see that and say, you know what, I would like to like that on a date or I would like to look like that, you know, if I'm going to, you know, an event or I'm going to a cocktail hour. I give people um, real style for real situations. So I think, um, I think people really identify with that and say, you know, that, that's a style I can follow. And, um, you know, I think everyone kind of has that common sense, like what, he, what he's saying is right. If I change my shirt this way or wear my boots this way, it's going to look a little bit better. So, yeah, I would say consistency and then um, actually really having that style to show guys, say, this is the way you should dress. So it's actually less about I'm just giving you this idea, but how you can actually implement it. Absolutely. No. Absolutely. And, and uh, DeAndre, same thing with you. You training the kids that you work with as well. How, same thing. Same level of trust implementing. How do you go about Im uh, implementing that within your field? Uh, man, so I think, you know, the biggest thing about um, about training people just in general is about building a relationship. Um, and one of, the, one of the key factors and key components in building any relationship is the vulnerability. And so um, that's one thing that I focus on early is finding ways to allow my clients to, first of all, see that I'm willing to be vulnerable with them and understand that I'll nurture their vulnerability. So that way they don't have to feel like I'm coming in and I'm judging them based off of where they are. I tell everybody that I work with, whether it's football or personal training, any type of training it is, is I'm going to meet you where you're at and then we'll grow from there. Because I feel like a lot of times people... Um, they interact with people that have these preconceived notions or expectations. And for me, it's like that, that, that doesn't matter here. When, it, when you're with me, when, you're, when we're in this space and when we're in this experience, that's out the window because I want you to be the best version of, of yourself that you can be and tap into that. And one of, the, one of the ways that you're able to do that is when your guard is down. But a lot of people don't feel like their guard can be down. So when you're able to tap into that with a client or a person or, you know, even a kid, and you actually see them for who they are and you're not like, hey, I see who you are and that's not acceptable. But you're like, I see you for where you are. You may not be where you want to be, but let's work to get there. That's when people are more, you know, they're more inclined to, you know, open up and be daring and try new things and, you know, really go go after whatever they want it is, you know, passionately with everything they got. Man. That was a bar. <laughs> <laughs> Everything was in there. Yeah, yeah. yeah um, man. <laughs> and I think even not really transitioning, but I think one of the things you talk about, especially within the black community and men in general, is just not showing that vulnerability. A lot of times vulnerability is shown as a sign of weakness when it really is kind of how you're helping build them up. It's a sign of strength. Right. I got to tap into you and not even break you down is a bad term, but just really right. if you can let me in, then I can build you up and I can help you be great as well by letting me in as well. How do you guys kind of feel, and I'll kind of go to, to back to you, Sean, in terms of uh, the vulnerability you just have in terms of black men. Like, is there a time in your life where you had to you know, overcome being vulnerable and it kind of took you to the next level? Or is there a time like maybe somebody reached out to you, one of your followers on social media, is like, hey man, what you did, what you shared, the content you created kind of helped me get through a, a tough space I might've been in as well. Yeah, the friends I've had in my life and family, too, along this journey, man, it, it was tough. You know, I quit my job to do this full time. Um, well, it was, it was like part time and part time. And man, I wasn't I wasn't really making money like that. You know, two, three hundred dollars in my account at the time. I didn't have any money. So I was in a very vulnerable place. But I realized if I'm going to keep on this path and get my all to this, I have to be able to talk to people and like get that stress off of me because that, mm -hmm. that financial stress is real. It will mm -hmm. it will affect you in your everyday life. 
and I couldn't let that happen. So I had, you know, my mom, my pop, you know, my lady, um, friends, people who I can talk to about. I mean, this is what I'm going through. I know I'm, I know I'm doing well in the social media space, but I'm not making any money yet. However, I'm grinding, and I would have those conversations about where I wanted to be a year from now. Um, so I. I don't know how, but now I have a lot of faith too. I always pray, but I realized that I needed to talk to people in order to get to where I'm at right now, or else mentally I wouldn't be able to push forward because I'm I'm held back by pride. I don't have no money in my pocket, or you know I'm I'm too old, or all these things. If you gotta if you got if you got a dream or belief, you gotta get that out of the way so you can stay on this path and make it happen. So it goes back to to the faith thing and the trust. You gotta trust yourself and you gotta have that faith that you're gonna make it happen. Yeah, I mean, man, another bar, <laughs> another bar. And then passing back to you, True, and with what you're doing as well, like even the transition, like having that faith in yourself, kind of going back to what you were saying, like, you know, a lot of times that athletes have this stigma of us not being able to make it, but even having that confidence within yourself, because I, I can imagine with you being at, you know, high school stud, college stud, now you in the pros, you pro bowl in the pros, stud in that, with that aspect. And I was like, football's all I know. How did you kind of have that trust within yourself, tapping into that bond and be like, no, this is going to work out, this is going to make it, so you can continue to provide for your wife and your kids and your family and that nature? Right. Well, I think it's one of those things. I know we like to, to kind of get up here and kind of put this highlight film out, right, of this is how it goes and this is what we do on social media. Okay, man, I'm shining, I'm doing my thing now and I made it to this level, but um, there is a trial and error, period. And that was for me, that's kind of what it was. I tried these different businesses and tried to do this on my own. And just like I talked about, um, that you got to build your team. I really felt like I had to build my team. And that's really what helped me um, to kind of get to the next level. So you try these different businesses. You try this other stuff. And in failure, I think there's growth in that. So that's what I had to go through those smaller failures. Um, of course, I say, thank God they weren't these huge failures, right? But um, I tried to dabble in different things. And you learn and you grow and you get to a point where, okay, I think I'm ready to take that next step and I really got to put my all into it. I can't do it halfway. Um, got to talk to the wife and let her know, okay, I'm going to be gone for some hours now. Mm -hmm. I need to really put the work in and that's really what it comes down to. You go through the trial and error phase and you build that confidence and you grow and you go to the next, uh, you go to the next level. How about yourself? How would you say in terms of overcoming that concept of failure, is there a moment in terms of breaking through? Uh, man, like, I just think that, you know, I was literally having a conversation with somebody literally yesterday about this, about them starting early in their entrepreneurship journey, and they were in business for like a year, and they weren't seeing the results. And I was just like, listen, one thing that I think for me that helped me when I was, you know, when I was done playing was just the fact that I just didn't quit. You know, like, you just find a way to get through each and every day. And like he, like Rashad said, be consistent. You know what I'm saying? Like, everybody's not going to see it. Everybody's not going to see the visibility right away but if you keep on putting out content putting out information putting out good energy you know building those relationships what starts to happen is that you get spoken about in rooms that you're not even in mm. and you know for me one of the things that i realized man was that you know the only le only l's that i was taking was lessons you know i wasn't going you know it wasn't you know failure it was just the ability for me to learn you know because i never know from my failure how it could be helping somebody else get over whatever they're going to get over, which actually happened to be yesterday. I was helping somebody, you know, encourage them through, you know, their shortcomings of early entrepreneurship. And, you know, the biggest thing was just don't quit. You know, you got to believe ultimately in yourself before anybody else around you will believe in you. And uh, that's what's helped me. I love two of the things that both of you all said, because one of the things we like to say is that you only fail when you quit. Because to your point, like, it's, a, it's not a loss, it's a lesson. Right. So when you fail, like, that's just like, you know what? I'm not going to do this anymore. But at the same time, we always say how you pivot is how you prosper. So you do, this path you start down on isn't going to be the path you end up on. And right. that's in any aspect of business, even as the more it grows. Like uh, Biggie said, more money, more problems. Because you got this idea, now I done made, you know, man, I'm making $1,000 a month. Now I'm making $10,000 a month. Now you're making $100,000 a month. From that standpoint, each time you have to have those systems and processes in place ahead of time to help you be able to maintain that when you get to that. So like if you hit $1,000, you got to be thinking, all right, what do I have in place to when I when $10,000 a month come in, I'm ready to go. If I'm making $10,000 a month, I got to have that process in place. And when $100,000 come in, I'm ready to go. If you don't, you got to take a step back and be like, okay, how do I kind of move forward through this? So I think that's really a key thing in terms of what you both said in terms 
it's not really an L, it's a lesson. And I think it's just redefining about how you can go about doing that. And I want to kind of transition that down to you in terms of helping people really redefine who they are. How do you kind of help redefine who they are and kind of creating that story and that content that's consistent for them to help them discover themselves? But how does Rashad shine through that? I'm a, it's a real simple statement. You guys probably know this as a football term. When you look good, you feel good. When you feel good, you play good. So I start, of course it starts on the inside, but when you walk out to the world, how you present yourself is how people receive you. I don't care what anyone says, there is a first impression when someone sees you. And especially as black men, it is in our, it's our best interest to have a great first impression. You know what I'm saying? Um, to to, to have, have that one step ahead already. So that's the way I, I, I try to tell men, and that's why I'm so consistent, is because I really do, I really go out the house this way. I really go on my everyday life, show up to job interviews. Even, even before I started to miss a little page, this was always me. And it's always yielded good results by having a good presentation, by smelling good, getting your hair cut. So I preach what I live to men, and I believe that's why it comes out so authentic. You know, you see me on camera every day, this is me. And I show when I'm bummy too, you know, because that's, you know, like you go to the yeah, grocery yeah. store or whatever, but be able to go in your closet and look presentable for the proper occasion. And um, I believe that the results will be better if you didn't do that. Mm. That's great, too, because not everybody sees the end journey. I think when you were talking about, like, people see everything on social media. And the they highlight see that, film, right? The highlight yeah, film, the highlight, exactly. the highlight yeah. film. Like, even as you said, you go out of your house bummy, too, because okay. this is who I am. Like, I'm yeah. not why this, I do want to be presentable, but this is not me all the time. And yeah. my life is not a highlight film. That is not real. So how do you go about with whether it's uh, kids that look up to you at your speaking engagement? I know you got one coming up later on tonight, whether it's your children. How do you go about... Uh, showing them like this is who I really am from your point of view and actually kind of living who you are kind of shine through well I think it really just comes down to being authentic don't don't try to um, step outside of yourself or put on a show of course there's a piece of it maybe because you're giving the presentation and you want things to look a certain way but you do want to make those impressions and you want people to know that you're here for business and you're um, serious and you want them to take you serious but um, I found that just being yourself, I mean, and being authentic, being true to yourself, and know, you know, the good things that you do, I mean, and know where you fall short. I keep going back to building this team. Um, you have to know kind of where you fall short. You got to make this self kind of evaluation so you can know those people that you need to bring into your camp, um, of course, in order for everything to blossom, everything to grow. And I think that's the same way that you're talking to people. Um, me, personally, I'm not a big talker, but I like to listen. I listen to people and I really internalize and I just take it all in. So um, I'm here to learn and I'm here to grow. I never want to come off as this cocky type of person or this ex-athlete that thinks, he, that thinks that he used to do something back in the day, but it's about growth, it's about being personable, it's about being cro uh, coachable, I hate to use the uh, <laughs> terms all the time, <laughs> the sports terms, yeah, but right. I think it's, it's a good thing though, you be coachable, you grow, and you do better after that. And how about yourself? Uh, man, I just think, um, for me, it's just, it's just whenever I, I'm talking to people, just have authentic conversations. I think that's what keeps me, you know, uh, that's, that's, what, that's what's most important to me, is having those conversations with people. I'm not necessarily like, I don't necessarily, you know, look to, you know, talk to a whole group of people. Like, that's not necessarily where I feel like I've been the best at. I mean, it's something that I'm working on more, but I feel like the, the interpersonal relationship, like the one-on-one -on -one conversations um, is where I'm really able to shine and help people um, wherever they're at, man. And, you know, one thing that I always knew growing up was that, you know, my purpose was to help people. I didn't necessarily know exactly how it was going to happen, and it shows up in, you know, multifaceted ways, you know, whether it's through football training, whether it's through personal training, um, whether it's talking about entrepreneurship, you know, whether it's having conversations that we had earlier. Um, and it's people that show me that I'm shining through, honestly, because it's not something that I'm looking at. Like, I don't approach situations like this is an opportunity for me to shine. It's just this is an opportunity for me to authentic and somebody's really asking me to share my opinion on something. Let me share it. And then it ultimately ends up being, you know, one of those situations like you were saying, like, that's a bar. And I'm like, oh, that is a bar. OK. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So that's how it ends up working out. So that's interesting that you say that as well, because I think even what you're doing, you're being vulnerable because you're letting them say this is who I truly am. The authenticity goes hand in hand with that vulnerability. 
So you can't be vulnerable without being authentic to who you are. That's when it's like, okay, am I really truly going to embrace what I'm feeling? Am I truly going to embrace who I am within this moment? So to that thing, I'm going to go down the line, kind of ask you, what's the best piece of advice and what's the worst piece of advice you've ever received? Let's go with the worst piece first. The worst piece of advice that I've ever um, received is, um, th is that you fight fire with fire, right? And especially if it's negativity, if you want to get into this negative thing and you want to spend your energy on that and go back and forth, I think it's really a bad look. Especially when you're trying to do um, things that are positive, you're trying to go to the next level, you've got all these goals and aspirations. It's hard to do that if you're going to be in this negative space, right? So um, the best advice that I ever got was um, to continue to learn. Just keep learning. Most people never really figure this thing out 100%. So to continue to be a student of life, to be a student of anything that you're doing, just be in that space and always be looking or listening for those bars, right? Those little things that you could take from that and you could take that and that could just take you to the next level and then you're off and running. Watch oh, man, there. okay, bad advice. Um, honestly, I'm, I'm trying to think of some bad advice I was given. Uh, you and me both. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to well, for me. I'm, tr I'm, try I'm trying to think of bad advice that I was given that registered with me and it stayed with me. Yeah. Because like, I mean, I'm you know I'm from the same you know pool as Marcus. It's like I'm hearing I'm having conversations with people. I, I hear people what they're saying, but I always take nuggets that I can apply to my life. And it's like I'm not gonna take bad advice from somebody. You know what I'm saying? Like, because that's not gonna help me. Mm -hmm. You know, you know, progress further along. But I would say. The best, one of the best pieces of advice I was given was that people don't value you until you value you. Mm. I think that that hit me early on, you know, in the entrepreneurship journey when it came to, you know, um, dealing with different types of clients and different type of people because people, they have their own agenda when it comes to, you know, the services that you provide. And so if you don't know your value and what you bring to the table, how can somebody else approach you and be like, oh, okay, well, I'm going to pay them what they're worth or I'm going to... I'm going to come at them with the right, with the professional approach or with the right approach instead of it just being, you know, like something that they didn't think through um, because it, it changes the whole narrative of conversation when they know the value that you bring to the table versus, you know, they don't know because they'll they'll question it. They'll manipulate. They'll try to do whatever they can to try to get over. It. And so it's just like once I once I established that, you know, I understood my value. I just I didn't accept any and everything. So I think that was the best advice I was given. And Rashad. Still on the, uh, the bad advice thing. I, I don't think I thought of anything. <laughs> However, I, what I did think about was what I see in people that didn't make it to this part of my journey and why they didn't. Mm -hmm. And I, and I want to say that was complacency. Mm -hmm. um, just, just not coming up with new goals, not coming up with new ways to challenge yourself, not being willing to challenge yourself. Um, that, that's a no-no. You know, um, that everyone's not self-motivated. But I, I challenge everyone to find a way to self-motivate yourself. You can't depend on someone to motivate you. You got to, as you said before, you got to have that belief in yourself. You have to, you know, whatever that purpose is, you got to believe that you're going to fulfill that purpose. Um, and good advice would be uh, from my grandmother, keep God first, you know, mm. um, you know, being able to get on your knees every day and pray, humble yourself, you know, understand that uh, there's a higher power. And um, you know, it's, you, you're blessed to be in the position you are, whether it's to be able to inspire people, whether you manager the job, whatever, you know, take pride in what position you are in life and play that role well. You, you never know where that would take you. So, yeah, I would say keep God first. I mean, you can't, you can't say put something over God. Man. <laughs> 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 I was like, I'm not supposed to call it out, but I can't put that over that one. Uh, <laughs> in terms of, I kind of think the same thing, like, because to your, to your, it's like bad advice, but it's also one of the things that's like, should I really have listened to that? Yeah. And you more so, like, you're disappointed in yourself by by he heeding to that advice and letting yeah. it impact you within that moment at that time versus saying, you know what, that wasn't really the best thing for me. But it's not really bad advice if you can kind of look back on it and reflect mm -hmm. and realize within that moment I was just in the midst of that season. Right. You know, you know, we in Seattle, mm -hmm. we know it likes to rain, so that was the rainy season yeah, for yeah, me. Yeah, 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 but yeah. one of the things going back to not to make it a religious conversation, one of the things they always like say, if you want God to make it rain on you, they're surprised if he makes a thunderstorm first. So he can't make it rain unless he's gonna make it storm. So one of the best pieces of advice I've heard, kind of slightly different, and we've been talking a lot about business professionalism in this one, and it was from one of my mentors, and he said, 
um, if you didn't belong in the room, you wouldn't be in the room. So since you're in the room, you might as well let your voice be heard. And that was really valuable to me. And it's not one of those things in terms of, oh, look at me, I'm Evan, I'm here, depending on the room. It's like, but at the same time, you will realize if you're there, you don't say anything. That room, the person who really is the alpha male in the room, who invited this dude? Why'd you invite this guy that didn't say anything? What's the point of him being here? Right, right. yeah. Right. So right. if you didn't belong in the room, you wouldn't be in the room. Mm. So since you're here, you might as well let your voice be heard. You got to be tactful, right. know when to like chime in and the thing. But they invited you to this room for a reason. You're not just there to be a fly on the wall. So and I think that was really powerful and impactful for me. Because as you all continue to move up, whether it's in the business sector that you're in, business sector that you're in, same thing with you, you're going to find situations where it's like, man, I'm in this room with so and so and so and so and so and so, but remind yourself, like they invited me here. I, I'm not here because I earned the right to be here. If they didn't see, as you were saying, value in them, if they didn't see value in you. Why would why would you be there? So you have to see that value in yourself. So you have to kind of let that shine through. Um, so about to wrap this up here. Once again, we out here in Seattle, the Emo City. Uh, we got my guy Marcus Trufant, my guy DeAndre Campbell, my guy Rashad Little. Kind of end this out with one final question for you all. If you could guys describe your style in three words or less, mm. what would it be? <laughs> That's a good one, huh? My style, um, my style, three words, um, cool, um, authentic, different. Okay, rock with that. Cool, okay. Uh, my style. Um, Oh, shoot. I, man, cool, calm, collected. It's like cool, calm, collected. No matter what I got on, I mean, I'm the same person. I, I act the same. Whether I got on something flashy or something chill, I'm still cool. How about yeah. yourself? Um, I've always been told casual fly. And I, and I believe it, too. I think I just have a very casual style, but I always add like a little swag to it. So. I like that. I should have stole yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. Yeah. Casual fly. Yeah. You, know yeah. you put saying? me on the spot. I was like, yeah. Yeah. Right. 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 Yeah, right. so, that's like, better than Soul Plane. They should have made the movie So once again, thank you to the city of Seattle. Thank you for everybody tuning in. Thank you for everybody rocking with us. It's, good a bit, it's been a good time. We will be on YouTube. See you soon.